We were working on the derivative of our inverse trig functions today, and we didn't have a chance to talk about the derivative of inverse secant of x. I just gave you the formula. And so in this video, I'm going to discuss how we derive that formula and also where in the world that absolute value came from. So let's dive in. Like we did with the other trig functions, let's just start with our formula for the derivative. Oh my goodness. And I hope you can see how I totally misspelled derivative there. Uh, our formula for the derivative of inverse functions. So we said that the derivative of f inverse of x, which we were writing like this, equals 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. I'm going to put the f, 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 inver f inverse of x in red here, just so you can see that those are two different things. So that was our formula. And basically what this is saying is we have two functions. We have f of x and the inverse function. If we are exploring... Um, the inverse sine of x, our f in this case, we're, no, we're not doing inverse sine, if we're doing inverse secant, our f of x would be uh, secant of x, and our f inverse of x would be inverse secant of x. So th those two functions are playing the roles of f and f inverse. And I guess if I'm going to do my colors correctly here, I should make this blue. f of x is uh, just secant of x. And then the derivative of f of x, just remember that the derivative of f of x, f prime of x, which is what we need in our formula right here on the denominator, is secant of x tangent of x. Let's remember that because that's going to come into play. Okay, so we've set the stage for figuring out the formula let me go ahead and run our function through this formula and we'll come up with our intermediate formula before we go ahead and talk about the absolute value part. So I simply copied over the information from the last slide and now what I'm going to do is write out what the derivative of inverse secant of x would be. So the derivative of inverse secant of x, and I'm just going to use the prime notation here, the derivative of inverse secant of x would be 1 over f prime of x with inverse secant of x plugged in. So that would be basically taking this red thing and sticking it where x is in these two places in the derivative. So we're going to have secant of inverse secant of x. times tangent, i got to make this thing longer here, times tangent of inverse secant of x. Okay, and I'm going to move that 1 over just because to me it doesn't look symmetric. So this is our initial formula for the derivative of inverse secant of x. As you know, we clean these things up by simplifying these two, this expression here on the bottom. And really what it means is I have to simplify these two expressions. And this is where it gets interesting. So I'll set up the basic um, structure that we use, our triangle, for the situation. And then what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this whole uh, idea of this um, the need for this absolute value. So remember, inverse secant of x is just some angle, and we've been calling that theta. So essentially what we do is we do a change of variables, and we say that the inverse secant of x is now called theta, and then we start by drawing a triangle. Now this triangle model has some limitations. Uh, since, since we're drawing it in a right angle, we're really only um, representing theta as somewhere between 0 and 90, right? We can't have two 90 degree angles, so that's, um, that's what this model will serve us for. And just keep in mind that we're going to have to deal with the fact that 
uh, our angle you know, could be some number bigger than 90. And we'll deal with that in a minute. And when I say 90, I mean pi over 2. Okay, here's the strategy that we use to set these problems up. So we said this was theta. And then since theta equals um, the, the inverse secant, what we did is we wrote down the hypotenuse as x and the adjacent as 1. That way, the secant of theta is x over 1. Then we use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for this missing leg here. And that will be the square root of x squared minus 1. And from here, what we did is we said, OK, I need to know what the secant of theta is. That would be the answer to this part of our product. And I need to know what the tangent of theta is. And that would be the answer to this part of the product. And so if we're not careful, we can write down an answer for this thing, right? Uh, this derivative would become 1 over the secant of theta is just a, a hypotenuse over adjacent, which is x over 1. So that first piece would just be x. And then the tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent, right? So this is opposite, this is adjacent, this is hypotenuse. The secant was hypotenuse over adjacent, x over 1, so I just wrote x there. And then the tangent, which is the second part of our denominator, would be opposite over adjacent, the square root of x squared minus 1 over 1. And like I said, if we're not careful, we could say that this is the formula for our derivative. But that's not always the case, so let me get into why we need to put the absolute value in there. It has to do with the domain and range for the inverse secant function and the tangent function. Okay, so I'm going to start a new slide. I'm just going to have a discussion with you about um, specifically the tangent of inverse secant of x. So what I want to do is give you a little background into the tangent and the inverse secant functions. First, let's talk about this inverse secant function. I hope that when you first learned about this, you learned that the angles that are produced from this function are all in the top half of the unit circle. So they start at 0, and they go all the way to pi. The only number that's not included is pi over 2, because there is no, uh, there is no secant for pi over 2. It's undefined. So the inverse secant function all of the values are between 0 and pi. In other words, all of our angle thetas are between 0 and pi. And what's happening is this inverse secant function is popping out some angle, and then it's being plugged into our tangent function. Now. Since we know the tangent function is receiving one of these angles, and we know the tangent is um, sine over cosine, what you need to know is that tangent is positive in the first quadrant, but it's negative in the second quadrant. And what we didn't account for when we drew our triangle and wrote out our square root of x squared minus 1 is when this thing's negative. So what we really need to discuss is the fact that there are two formulas that we need to follow for tangent of theta, for tangent of inverse secant of x. It's like a piecewise defined function. We're going to use regular old square root of x squared minus 1 when we're in the first quadrant. In other words, when theta is less than or equal to uh, or 0 is less than or equal to theta is less than or equal to pi over 2, when we're between 0 and pi over 2. But the tangent is obviously negative when we're in the second quadrant, so the output of that function has to be negative, and the only way that can happen is if we stick a negative sign in front of the square root of x squared minus 1, because the principal square root won't be negative. So this happens between pi over 2 uh, and pi. And actually, we're not going to have a value at pi over 2 because there's no, there's no inverse secant at pi over 2. So I'm just going to do this. Okay. 
Now that's a weird way to write this piecewise function because I don't mention x. If we look at the inverse secant function on a graph, basically it looks like this. I'm going to sketch that part. So just down here, if you were to graph this in decimals or something, uh, what you would see is essentially a curve that starts here and goes this way with an as uh, no, 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 let me, uh, the asymptotes at pi over 2. So there's, there's, an, there's a horizontal asymptote at pi over 2, and essentially what we have is we have this function starting here, and then we have the other one starting here and going this way. There are no x values for this function between negative 1 and 1. The inverse secant function can only receive numbers that are greater than or equal to 1 or less than or equal to negative 1. So if we convert these intervals here to x, what we essentially get is that we're going to use square root of x squared minus 1 whenever x is greater than or equal to 1 and negative x squared minus 1 whenever x is less than or equal to negative 1. And that's because when you graph the inverse tangent, or the, the tangent of inverse secant of x, uh, and I'll do that in, let's see, I need another color here. I'm going to do that in yellow. The graph goes like this. It starts here and it takes off, and it starts here and it takes off. But again, there are no values in here because x can't be between negative 1 and 1. Okay, so this is the key, that there are two situations. Case 1 is when we are greater than 1, when x is greater than or equal to 1. We're going to use the positive square root. In case 2, we're going to use the negative square root. So I'm going to go back to my derivative formula, and I'm going to write it in that way. And then I'll show you where the absolute value comes from. Okay, so I've sort of broken this down into two cases. I'm just going to draw a little line right here for now. Uh, essentially, what we've done now is we've broken our derivative into two pieces. Uh, and by the way, this is a negative sign right here. Let me, uh, let me clean this up a little bit. Sorry about that. Ooh, goodness. I guess I'm just going to rewrite it. Uh, this is x times negative square root of x squared minus 1. Okay, so... When x is greater than or equal to 1, we just have the derivative formula as 1 over x times x squared minus 1, the exact formula that we came up with when we drew the triangle. But now that we've investigated the inverse secant function and the tangent function, we have a second case, which is when x is less than or equal to negative 1. This is the formula. Now, our goal is to put this into one formula, to squish it together into one formula. So to do that, what I want to do is I want to examine what absolute value of x really means and work my way backwards. Now, I've had this discussion with you before, uh, but let me, let me rehash it with you. The absolute value of x essentially is treated in one of two ways depending on the value of x. Oh, goodness, um, my drawing is just not good tonight trying to draw a curly brace here. How about this? Okay, like a piecewise function. So, algebraically, when you see the absolute value of x, you either make that equal x, and that is when x is greater than or equal to 0, right? If x is already positive or 0, you don't need the absolute value bars at all. However, if x is less than 0, in other words, if x is negative, then the absolute value of x acts like negative x. And we've used this fact when we were doing limits um, as uh, when we had vertical asymptotes. We were careful to decide which version of the absolute value of x we were dealing with. Okay, so uh, I'm going to work backwards now from that. So do you agree that if x is greater than or equal to 1, it's definitely greater than or equal to 0. So the absolute value of x would equal x. And do you agree, uh, that's for x is greater than or equal to 1, and do you agree that when x is less than 0, x is also, uh, excuse me, when x is less than uh, or equal to negative 1, it's also less than 0. And so this is true. So what I do is, and actually I'm going to go up here and rewrite this for you. Uh, I just want to rewrite this formula here. Uh, I'm going to just 
multiply that out on the bottom and this becomes negative x square root of x squared minus 1. What I'm basically saying is I have both conditions. I have x is greater than or equal to 1 with a regular x and x is less than or equal to 1 with a negative x. So to squish this together into one formula we can write that the derivative of inverse secant of x is in fact represented by the formula, the single formula, absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus 1. And I think that's about all I need to say about this. Um, it's, it was an interesting thought uh, experiment for me uh, to try and figure out a good way to explain this. Um, it has to do with the fact that the inverse secant function returns values in both the first quadrant and the second quadrant. So that triangle that we drew didn't really represent the second quadrant. It only represented the first quadrant. And we had to take into account this case, too, when we were in the second quadrant. And when you do that, you end up with this second formula. And the way we reconcile it uh, and put them together is by remembering that the absolute value takes care of that for us. So don't panic in trying to put this all together, but just realize there is a reason it has to do with the first quadrant and the second quadrant of the unit circle, and we need those absolute value bars there. And the same thing holds true for the uh, cosecant, the inverse cosecant uh, derivative. Um, that formula has a negative, you know, a negative, so it's negative 1 over the absolute value of x squared minus 1. But the reason for the absolute value is the same. And, and so just don't panic with that. Um, but this was this is my um, hodgepodge version of why we need the absolute values. Okay, so you know where to find me if you have questions. This was just me getting my thoughts down uh, for you to watch. And then, of course, if it generates questions, that's even better. Uh, in the meantime, take care.